This is Julie Pearson, Little Thunder, with the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program at Oklahoma State University. Today is May 22nd, 2018, and I'm interviewing Don Patterson, a former Shilako student from the class of 57. Um, Don, you've served in the Air Force. You've been president of the Tonkawa Tribe and have other positions. You started the Fort Oakland Drum Group, and your MC abilities are often called on around Indian Country. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Lamont, Oklahoma. It's a small town just, just uh, west of Tonkawa. Okay. And uh, I grew up uh, there, you know, at a very early age and then, and then in, in and around Tonkawa, yeah, Oklahoma. And then, uh, the Indian school at Pawnee, Pawnee Indian School, Pawnee Agency. Okay. And I was there during the grade school years. Yeah. What did your folks do for a living? Well, my mother was just a housewife, you know. My father was a, a carpenter. Yeah. Any brothers or sisters? I have three sisters. Uh, two of them are deceased now, so uh, my youngest sister is still living here. Yeah. What was your relationship to your grandparents on either side of your family? What? I don't understand that question. Um, were your grandparents alive when you were younger? Did you yes, have, okay. yes, yes, yes. I was wondering if you could talk about them just a little. Well, yeah, yeah, I knew, I knew my grandparents on, on both sides, yeah, you know. Uh, my my, my grandfather on my dad's side was very, very old. As a matter of fact, he was born before the Civil War. Okay. And, uh, and uh, he was quite old, you know, and uh, as a matter of fact, he was about 90, 92 years old when he died in uh, 1952. So I was like 13, 13 years old when he died. So I knew him very well. and. Uh, he was uh, he was pretty interesting because he told a lot of stories about the time in his youth, which was back in the 1800s. Matter of fact, he told me a story about the time he inadvertently met the outlaw Jesse James, you know, in sometime around the 1880s, you know, as they were traveling across uh, across the prairie going to uh, Guthrie, Oklahoma, which at that time was a capital of the, of the territory at that time, you know. So that was kind of an interesting story, yeah. yeah. And then my, my grandmother, too, on my mother's side, she, she too, was, was, was born, you know, in 1892. So she was, she was, she lived during that early reservation era, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, she died in uh, 1964. So I knew her most of my young, young, early childhood and my young adult life too. And got a lot of good, interesting historical stories from both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, were you around the Tonkawa language at all? Growing yeah, up? my my grandmother my grandmother spoke the language. My mother in our household. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. Um, you explained that Tonko is kind of different in that it's almost more like a tribal town than some of the other native nations. Well, Tonkawa itself, the town of Tonkawa, you know, is, a, is just a small non-Indian community, you know, that sprung up during the land rush days, you know. But the Tonkawa tribe and the original reservation area which surrounded what is now the town of Tonkawa, you know, uh, uh, had a, the agency located there, and it was called Oakland at that time, the Oakland Agency of the Nez Perce, uh, a history that very many people are not aware of in the state of Oklahoma, that the Nez Perce lived on that reservation there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Nez Perce under the leadership of Chief Joseph, of Chief Joseph fame, you know, mm -hmm. who was removed from the uh, Northwest a territory back in those days and they lived on that reservation for about seven years uh, right there at the same at the same place where the Tonkawa now live 
and they got permission uh, yeah, to move back to their home country back there, and then the Tonkawa were moved right in onto the same reservation, mm -hmm. into the same agency, and even occupied some of the some of the frame houses that were built for the Nez Perce at that time. And that community is called Fort Oakland today. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you for sharing that. So you went to Pawnee Indian School. Yes, I did. From what age to what age? Uh, I'm not sure my exact age, you know, but I was there in, in grade school until that was an elementary school. It only went mm -hmm. through the eighth grade, you know. So. I went, I went to school there through the eighth grade, graduated from the eighth grade at that school, you know. And then I, I went on to uh, public school in the same town, Pawnee, Oklahoma. Uh, the, the government had, uh, had initiated a, a plan in those days whereby the students who were at the Indian school could continue to come back to the school, live in the dormitory, you know, uh, eat in the dining hall. Uh, but uh, uh, be bused into town, you know, to Pawnee Public School. So uh, we we were we encountered busing way before busing became popular. That was back in the early fifties, you know, around nineteen I don't know nineteen fifty four somewhere around in there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So how did you end up at Shalako? Well, I, I like like a lot of Indian. Uh, Kids in those days, you know, uh, uh, school was not a high priority, you know. We lived in uh, what you might consider poverty conditions at home, you know. As a matter of fact, my mother enticed me to go to school with the idea that uh, I would uh, receive uh, uh, my own bed and, and three meals a day, you know, and, and, and that's, all I, that's all I needed, you know, and I said, I'll go, I'll take it, you know. And so I went to school there. but. After, after Pawnee and the experience at the Pawnee High School, I, I didn't really like it that well, you know. So I, I dropped out like a lot of, like a lot of Indian students do. I, I dropped out, you know, in the, in the ninth grade, you know, and and uh, I I went back to school May the following year in the ninth grade again and. I think the next year I went back in the ninth grade again, you know. <laughs> I was, How come you kept dropped? What was it you didn't like? Well, you know, uh, uh, you know, it was, it was difficult living at home, you know. I mean, we're living under poor, you know, poor conditions, you know. Uh, I was a member of a six, six family home, you know. My, myself and my three sisters, my mom and dad, and we lived in a one room house, so if you could imagine. It was like a log cabin, basically, just one room, you know. And so we all lived in one room, no running water, no electricity, outdoor toilet, you know, that sort of thing. And, and so uh, living conditions were not good, you know. And, and so uh, uh, the school at Pawnee was good. I enjoyed that, you know, but I wasn't too crazy about public school in Pawnee in town, you know. And so I, uh, I just kind of dropped out from there. And, and didn't do much of anything, you know, but just kind of hang around for the next couple of years. And then I had an aunt. I had an aunt that uh, uh, lived down in Pawnee, ha happened to live down there. I went down there one time just to visit, you know, and, and she kind of got on to me, you know, for not being in school, you know. And uh, so uh, I, I, I took that, you know, uh, and uh, she, she suggested that that if she could get me into school, would I go, you know? And I said, well, sure I would. She said, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down to the agency. So she walked down to the agency there at Pawnee, you know, did whatever was necessary to, to uh, you know, start the ball rolling to get me enrolled in Shilaku, you know? I see. And so she did, you know, so she did. And she come back and she had all the paperwork and everything, she said, you're in. All you have to do is just get yourself up there, you know? <laughs> so, I went back home, went back to Tonka and I told my mom and my grandma and everybody that my aunt, you know, uh, had uh, had made arrangements for me to go to Shilako, and so they said, well, good, we'll take you up there, and so they took me up there, and, and that's how I got there. You know? yeah. <laughs> so it was Pawnee High School you didn't like? Pawnee High? Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I shouldn't say I didn't like Pawnee High School, you know, I had a lot of friends there, you know, and, 
And uh, I, I've been, I lived in Pawnee, you know, at the Indian school and knew, you know, practically everybody in the community, you know, so there were a lot of good, a lot of good acquaintances, a lot of good friends there, you know. And just, uh, I don't know, just the idea, you know, that I just didn't, didn't really care for public school. Mm -hmm. Not Pawnee in general, you see, but right. just public school public in general, school. you know, right. yeah. Right. And so I didn't, I just kind of dropped out from there, yeah. So, um, what was, what grade did you enter Shalako then? Well, I was in the ninth grade, which was like my third year. Yeah. <laughs> I tell everybody, you know, for, for, for just for, uh, kind of for humor's sake, I was in the ninth grade three years and, and finally just dropped out. I figured, what the heck, if I didn't get it by then, you know, there's no, no hope for me, you know. So, anyway. Uh, and even when I got to Shilako, you know, some of my friends that I went to school with at Pawnee, they were already uh, grades ahead of me, you know. And, right. and I was ahead of them at Pawnee <laughs> school, you know, so I kind of got behind, you know. That didn't, that didn't do much for my, mm -hmm. you know, my self-worth at that time either, you know. So mm -hmm. it kind of, uh, that's the way it went, you know, yeah. What was... Uh what are your memories of your first year? Uh, Sherlock was a good school, you know, I liked it, you know. The same as uh, Pawnee, you know, Indian boarding school, I liked it. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, and I was glad to go there, you know. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, you've probably read a lot, you know, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the negative nature of Indian schools in general, you know, and when it was uh, when it was kind of popular to whip on Indian schools back in a few years ago, you know, but uh, I don't share that same sentiment, you know. Mm -hmm. I went to Indian school, you know, two different Indian schools, and, and, and I liked both of them, and, and if they were operating today, if I had kids, I would send my kids there, mm -hmm. you know, so uh, I really enjoyed them that much, you know, like that, you know, yeah. And Shilako was a good school, you know. Uh, Shilako was a... Uh, uh, it was not only a school for academics, but it had a uh, uh, considerable uh, range of, uh, of trade schools that a person could, uh, could uh, uh, be a part of, you know. Matter of fact, you know, the, the uh, Votech system that we have today, you know, all around the state of Oklahoma, I suppose, was kind of uh, 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 sprung off of, Influence. I suppose, you know, the trade school that the Indian schools had at those days, you know. They had, uh, had schools for carpentry and plumbing and auto mechanics, you know, and painting, you know, and, and uh, agriculture, you know, a lot of good things, you know, that a person could uh, apply themselves into, you know. And the school had a policy that you had to, you had to go to school, an academic classroom for a half a day, and then, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, the other half of the day was in uh, a trade of your choice, you know, so. I chose, what did you choose? Uh, I chose automo automobile mechanics at that time, you know. And so I, I spent a, a lot of time there as well, you know. And then Shilako was a large agriculture school, you know. It was almost a self-sustaining school, you know. Had a large farm, you know, uh, uh, dairy and, and uh, uh, pigs and sheep and chickens and turkeys, you know, uh, uh, cows and horses, you know, and it's almost every kind of farm animal you could think of, you know, and, and uh, they supplied the meat for the for the dining hall, you know. Uh, I remember one day I butchered 12 sheep one morning by myself oh, wow. one time. You know? So <laughs> I kind of got that, kind of got that got experience that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Who were some teachers or administrators that you remember? The, uh, the superintendent was, uh, uh, he was the famous superintendent at Shilako for Seemed like forever. His name Allie was Correll. Correll. Mm -hmm. Correll. Yeah, he was there when I was there. Superintendent was named Muller or Mueller, something like that. I can't remember. Muller. Muller. I believe his name was. Yeah, you know. And then I um, uh, had a teacher that I remember, Arnikin, Mrs. Arnikin, homeroom teacher. And it seems like everybody that went to Shilako uh, knew Mrs. Arnikin. You know. And. Uh, dormitory matron by the name of uh, Mrs. Mozik Dano. Yeah, I remember her very well, you know, yeah, yeah. What was your um, worst or best memory of being on detail, having a detail? Say that again? What's your best or worst memory of, you know, being a assigned detail? Well, 
<coughs> you know, back in those days, uh, they believed in corporal punishment. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was not unthinkable to get a good paddling back in those days. And they had a, they had a, a systematic procedure for that, you know, that if you got in trouble and uh, you were uh, 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 sentenced to uh, so many licks, you know, by the paddle, you know, it was done by the uh, uh, sportsman's letterman's club, the letterman's club, you know, and all of the lettermen had those big paddles, you know, like you like you see down at down at OSU, you know, the the roughnecks, the paddles that they use and everything, you know, and so uh, the 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 letterman's club they had those paddles, kind of symbolic of their office, you know, and if you got if you got sentenced to a paddling by the letterman's club. You had to stand out in front of the dormitory while each letterman walked by and whacked you with his paddle, you know. So depending on how many lettermen there were available that day, you got a pretty good licking, you know. Yeah. So so that was that was one. And then they had another one. Uh, the uh, someone had an idea at that time to build a golf course up on the school at Shalaka. You know? A school the school had a lot of sports, you know, that person could get involved in, you know, football, baseball, basketball, had an Olympic-sized swimming pool, you know, and, and uh, somebody decided they needed a, ba a, a golf course. Now, you know, us young Indian guys, you know, golf was the farthest thing from our mind, you know. Who plays golf anyway, you know? And uh, this uh, football coach, his name was uh, Schult, Schult, I can't remember his first name, you know, but he had the idea to build a golf course, you know, out there on the school. And so the biggest project for building that school was clearing the land of trees, you know. And so uh, if you got if you got uh, in trouble and you got punished or sentenced to some kind of some kind of uh, punishment detail, you know, you got assigned to what we call a Schultz chain gang, which was working out there on weekends chopping trees to make room for the future golf course. You know? So I chopped a lot of trees off of that property up there and helped build that golf course initially. <laughs> and that's probably my worst worst experience up there was serving on Schultz chain gang. What did you do for fun? For fun? Well, you know, school you know, school was fun, you know, you hang around as sports, you know, uh, you know, had intramural sports, you know, and uh, and uh, you know we had an Indian club, or called Indian club. Even though it's an Indian school, it's kind of kind of strange to think that you had an Indian club in an Indian school. I mean, the whole school was an Indian club. But uh, they had various clubs, like home ec club, you know, and ag club, like that. And and the Indian club was all of those people who were interested in in uh, gathering up on certain days to to sing and dance and to carry on some of the some of the what we call powwow traditions today. You know. And so we'd gather down in the uh, in the, the old girls' gym, which was called the Flaming Arrow at that time. You know, had a name, you know, like that. And and we'd gather in there, and somebody'd bring a drum, you know, and and we'd sing, and and people would dance. Mostly the girls, you know, they'd bring a shawl and they'd dance. And we they'd allow us, you know, a couple hours, you know, uh, on a scheduled basis to to have Indian club, you know. And so you know that was a big important thing to us, you know. And then, you know, of course, as part of our duty, you know, we were assigned uh, uh, in the agriculture program, uh, you were assigned to uh, uh, a job of, of caring for a particular animal of your choice. You, know, you could choose to, uh, to take a lamb and raise that lamb, you know, and, and uh, uh, take care of it, groom it and feed it, and, and even show it in the, in, the, in the county fairs coming up, or a steer or a horse, you see, whatever, you know. And I chose I chose to to take a horse, you know. So I I, I I was down on the weekends, kind of grooming my horse, looking after my horse, and things like that. So that was kind of a fun thing on the side too, you know. But most of the time, you know, it was uh, it was just socializing with the students, you know. I had a big campus, you know, and a beautiful campus had a large oval, you know, a big large oval, you know, which is a nice grassy area had a fountain in the middle of it, you know, and. It, of course, all of the school, the buildings was all built around that oval, you know. And the rule was that uh, uh, you could not you could not walk on the grass during during uh, uh, 
certain hours of the day, I think it was between eight and four o'clock, you know, and you know, and you had to walk on the sidewalk. You can't even get on the grass on the on the oval. But after after supper, uh, I don't forget what time supper was, four thirty or five o'clock, you know. And after supper, you're allowed to to go out on the oval on the grass and socialize, you know. So people go out there and sit around with their girlfriends, you know, and guys, and just just kind of hang around and play games, you know, toss a ball, you know. Somebody invented a, a little game that I think uh, was a, was the beginning of uh, of uh, frisbee. You know. Is that right? Someone took a, a lid off of a snuff can lid, you know, and you know the shape of it was about you know three three inches diameter, and they would toss that lid around, you know, and it would float just like a frisbee, you know. Oh my goodness. And and a whole bunch of guys would stand out there on a, on a campus, you know, and throw that snuff lid around like a frisbee. You if we had any good sense, we would have probably invented a, the frisbee in those days and become millionaires, you know. But you know, we didn't think of things like that, you know. We needed to patent that. <laughs> yeah. Some some time later, you know, uh, they had that frisbee became a very popular toy, and somebody got rich on it. You know? <laughs> so that was a kind of an idea of some of the things that we'd do, you know, in the evening time, you know. Yeah. And we sneak out to the orchard, you know, in the evening time, and pick apples and peaches and stuff, you know, for <laughs> extra treats, you know, like that, you know, just school, school, school kids stuff, you know, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. How aware were you of the National Guard armory? I wasn't in the National Guard. But you knew it was there. Oh yeah, the National yeah. Guard was there, yeah. yeah. The National Guard was there, you know, and I, I, I wasn't in that, I didn't, I didn't get into that, yeah. 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 So what did prompt you when you left Shalako? Why did you leave Shalako, and what prompted you to enlist in the military? Well, you know, uh, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell a lot of this current generation today that in my day, and in, 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 in my generation's day, you know, we all aspired to be soldiers, you know. That's part of our upbringing, you know. The, the culture of our people, you know, uh, whether it be Tonka or Ponka or, or Kiowa or Cheyenne or whatever, you know, our, our, our whole history of our nations were based and built around the warrior concept, you know. All the dances, you know, that we dance, the war dances and the soldier dances and all the ceremonies are built around the concept of the warrior, you know. And so, so that was part of our upbringing, kind of ingrained into our, our self-concept, you know. And in order to, to be legitimate participants in that kind of activity, you had to become one. You know, and so we all aspired to be be soldiers in those days. You know, and so all of my generation, as they as they grew up and got old enough, they they immediately went into the military service because that was the only way uh, in these contemporary modern times that you could become a warrior. You know, unlike the old days. You know, and so that was our way to uh, to acquire that uh, that kind of a status. You know, and so uh, that was my inclination right early on. You know. And then How we, old would, were you and then we you? would sit and listen to the old guys tell all them war stories, you know, and and kind of inspire us, you know, to want to to be a part of that, you know. And so, yeah, and so uh, that's that's kind of how it happened, you know. Were you eighteen or and were so, you older? Yeah, and so I went down. I finally decided that I'd go down and and uh, join the service, you know. Yeah, I had a friend of mine. He was he was in the army, and he was always talking about the army, and you know. And, you know, and good times he had and things he he experienced, you know, and so I thought, well I'll go down and join the army, you know. So I happened to be I happened to be down in Shawnee, Oklahoma, you know, at that time, you know. And uh, the military recruiting officers had their had their offices in a local hotel, you know, the lobby of a hotel, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, you drive by the hotel and you see the big sign out in front that says Uncle Sam Uncle Sam wants you, you know, that sort of thing. So I went down there to join the army, you know, and uh, it was around noontime. I guess I really wasn't paying attention to the to the hour, but I walked in there at noontime, and I, I asked the hotel clerk there where the the desk of the army recruiting sergeant was, and she sits right over there. I could see all of the the, the army signs and everything, and, and nobody there, you know. I said, "Well, he's not here." What? And she looked around and she said, "Well, he was there a few minutes ago. I don't know where he went, you know." 
I said, well, you know, I, I can't wait, you know. Uh, uh, where's the Navy guy at, you know? And she said, well, his, his desk is over there, you know. And so I went over there, and he wasn't there either, you know. And I said, well, how are they going to recruit, you know, not being in an office? And she said, well, it's, uh, it, I think it's lunchtime. And she said, that Army and Navy guy, they always go to lunch together. So they're probably out to lunch. Now I'm getting mad, you see, you know. I said, well, well, who is here, you know? And uh, there, were, there was a, up in a mezzanine, you know, a little balcony up in the second floor. There was an Ar uh, Air Force recruiting officer standing, leaning over the balcony, hearing all that ruckus I was making down there, you know? And, uh, and uh, she said, well, there's an Air Force guy, and he's looking down there, you know? And so I said, well, I'll go see him. And I walked up the stairs, signed up with the Air Force guy, you know? So that's kind of how it went. <laughs> That's a great story. Huh? So, um, what did you, they sent you to boot camp first? Yeah, yeah. I went to boot Where? camp you know, in San Antonio, Texas, you know. And I went to, you know, from there I went to a, a tech training in a, in a place called Chinook, Illinois, up just south of Chicago, you know. To work on airplanes? Yeah, yeah. And you had that automobile experience too. Yeah, uh, that, that, that. I, totally different. I guess the, the, the mechanic aptitude, you know, probably helped, you know, but I didn't have anything to do with automobiles, you know, and so then I, I went from there and I, I was trained in air crew, air sea, air, air crew, uh, sea rescue, you know, yeah, you know. Okay. And so I went through that training and got sent to a, a place called Offutt Field in Nebraska, you know, which was under the old, old Strategic Air Command, which is no longer in existence today, you know. And then uh, got involved in, in, you know, in that particular duty, you know. And then I was also uh, trained as a, as a, as a, uh, what we call a drag chute rigger, uh, like a parachute rigger, but it was a drag chute for B-52s and B-47 bombers, you know, real large, you know, uh, you've probably seen them where airplanes come in and they pop that chute and it mm -hmm. slows them down. As they, and so I, I was trained as one of those, you know, like that. So mm -hmm. I became a, a drag chute rigger and, and uh, would load those uh, uh, parachutes into those bombers and things like that, you know. And, and was, were you flying quite a I, bit yeah, too? Yeah, I was also in a rescue, air sea, air, air sea, air crew rescue, you know, like that, and uh, survival, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, and then got involved in uh, a little bit later on in air in-flight refueling, you know, where big uh, uh, Air Force uh, fuel tankers would would uh, refuel uh, bombers, B-52s particularly over over overseas in the China Sea and Taiwan, places like that. Yeah. What was it like the first time you flew? You hadn't been in an airplane before. Yeah, well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, you know. First time I was on an airplane was when I left Oklahoma City, you know, from the recruiting station to, to go to San Antonio. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know. So that's the first time I was ever on an airplane, you know, and so, yeah, I, I thought it was fun, you know. Yeah, yeah, you know. But that was a, that was a commercial flight from Oklahoma City to San Antonio, you know. Right. And the rest of the time was, in, Military aircraft, yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, Flew in some old, some of the old aircraft that were still still in existence then, old, old what they call B-25s, which were World War II replicas, you know, and they were, they were clunkers, you know, at that time, you know. And, noisy. Uh, noisy, you know. <laughs> Had some had some near misses with those, you know. They they would almost crash land every time they landed, you know. <laughs> I mean, it was it was the norm, you know. <laughs> you know, so that was kind of scary, yeah, like uh -huh. that, you know. Yeah. You know, and then my scariest moment was uh, trying to help rescue a, a crashed uh, crashed fighter plane, you know, where whereby uh, both both pilots in it were literally burned to death, you know, and oh. couldn't really couldn't really do anything about him, you know. So mm -hmm. Probably my most vivid memory of, of, of those times, you know, like that, you know. Mm -hmm. To watch those two, watch those two pilots literally uh, burn to death, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, 
anyway. How do you feel like your um, Shilako experiences or even other experiences kind of helped you be ready to enlist, helped you do a good job in the military? <coughs> well, you know, I, I don't know, it's pretty hard to say, you know, what what impact, you know, school had on any young life, you know. I mean, you, you learn things, you know, primarily academics, but you also learn, you all learn uh, order and discipline, you see, you know, like that, you know, and, and uh, learn to be regulated, you know. Yeah, you know, you get up at this hour, go to school at that hour, you know, and, and uh, report here, report there, you know, and, and then, of course, you had duties and responsibilities, you know, you just didn't, you know, just, you know, you had to take, one of the things about Indian school is you had to learn to, to take care of yourself, you know, I keep your clothes in order, you know, your, your personal, you know, your personal uh, things in order, you know, and you had housekeeping responsibilities, you know, you had to clean and mop and wax floors, you know, and wash windows and, and you know, kind of do all of that stuff, you know, and I suppose all of that stuff kind of had, had some kind of lasting impact on, on uh, future life, you know, yeah. When did you? I still do that today, you know, wash and clean and mop the floors and <laughs> keep the dishes washed, you know. I tell everybody that's some of my whole Indian school training. <laughs> when did you decide to leave the military? Well, I, I just served my term, you know. Okay. <clears throat> I served my term and uh, uh, as as I neared the end of my term, you know, uh, uh, the, the the squadron commander, part of his job was to try to uh, recruit you for re-enlistment, you know, and so they they recruited me pretty hard for re-enlistment, you know, and, and I was bound and determined just to serve my time, you know, and and move on, you know, and and they treated me pretty good, you know, they gave me some real cushy jobs, you know, uh, you know, uh, in the last. In the last uh, 90 to 120 days of my enlistment, you know, they they give me a real good job, you know, and uh, and uh, th that was pretty neat, you know, and they, they made me a, a courier for uh, special electronic uh, uh, computerized equipment, you know, that that they used in the in the missile defense program, which was was uh, uh, prevalent in those days, and what they called the the dew line around the Arctic Circle up there, where they had, mm -hmm. where they had uh, uh, strategically placed uh, missiles to guard against uh, attacks from from you know from Russia and uh, European countries across the North Pole like that, you know. So you were stationed up there. Yeah, and so I, 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 my job was to go gather that that equipment up, you know, and and uh, bring it by airplane all the way down to. Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma City, oh which was goodness. home basically. You yes, see, you yes. know, so they gave me a job of bringing, you know, uh, special equipment down to Tinker to be to be uh, tested and calibrated, you know, on a plane. You know, I was responsible for it, you know, and so after I signed it over to the the maintenance people at, at Tinker, I I I just be free to wait on it and to take it back, you know. Sometimes I'd, I'd go home for a week or two at a time, you know, <laughs> waiting on that on that stuff. And once it was finished, you know, they'd call me up, you know, and say, "Hey, your stuff is ready." And I'd beat it back to Tinker, and they'd already have it loaded up in a old C-47, you know, a, a plane, you know. And I'd jump back in, and away we'd go back and, <laughs> and take it back, you know. And, wow. And uh, that's a pretty cushy job, you know. And it, and it gave me free time at home, you know, without taking leave, you know. So. Yes. I always knew that that was that was part of their plan to try to get me to to re up or you know re sign up, but I didn't. When I when I uh, my, when my term expired, I I went ahead and took my discharge and went back home. You know. And you hadn't had any time in Europe, or they had you hadn't spent any time with the Air Force in Europe, or what? No. Have you been in Europe? With the Air Force at, or not, not in Germany? Not, a, not no. in Europe, you know, no. in the okay. Pacific, yeah. yeah. In the Pacific, yeah. okay. In yeah. Hawaii? Yeah, Taiwan. Taiwan, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so when my time was up, you know, I, I was just bound to determine to, to go on, you know. Mm -hmm. I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't interested in a career military, you know. Mm -hmm. 
always interested in becoming a warrior, you know, and once that, once that status was established, I'm ready to move on, you see. You know? One of the things that I have to say, uh, probably the best thing that ever happened to me in there was, I was a high school dropout, you know. And in those days, you know, the military would accept high school dropout. Today you have to be at least a high school graduate or, or even a junior college graduate to, to get in the military, but I was a high school graduate, you know. And uh, one of my squadron commanders, you know, he noted that, you know, and, and he'd give me counseling every now and then. He said, uh, uh, Patterson, he had a kind of accent. He said, Patterson, he said, you really need to, 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 to uh, improve your schooling, you know. And he said, we have a GED program, you know. He said, uh, it, it would be wise of you to, to involve yourself in that. Well, I'll think about it, you know. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, you know. And uh, so I went over to the, you know, and of course after hours, kind of, you know, after, you know, not they would allow you some time during during duty hours, you know, to devote to them. But I went over and talked to them, and the guy said, "Yeah," I said, "Yeah, you can, you study, you take these classes, you know, and then at at at, at a time when they figure you're you're uh, you know proficient enough, you take the test, and and if you uh, pass, you know, you will will award you a, a general education." certificate, GED certificate. And and I said, well, what, what is that? And he said, well, it's a high school diploma equivalent, you know. And I said, well, all right, that sounds good, you know. And so I, I signed up, you know. And I went in a GED class, you know, and I took the training and I took the test and and I, I, I got, a, got a GED, you know, a general, you know, the, the equivalent, you know. And when they, when they awarded that to me, I talked to him, I said, now, is this just like a high school diploma? He said, yes, it's an equivalent high school diploma, military GED. I said, well, could I go to college on the basis of this? He said, you certainly could, you know. You know? And I thought, well, that's something to think about, you know. And uh, so after I got out of military, you know, I went to work in the civil service, you know. I went right back to Tinker, Tinker Field down there. Mm. I worked around different kind of jobs, you know, mm. construction and this and that. And, and I went to work back at uh, Tinker Field back there, you know, uh, doing some of the same things that, you know, that uh, that my Air Force duties uh, entailed, you know. And so I, I worked there for a while, you know. And and then, and then uh, you know, I was uh, going to work one day, you know, at Tinker Field, walking in in the morning, lining up, punching a time clock like all of the, all of the factory workers do, you know. <laughs> And while I was standing in line, there's a long line punching a time card, I heard somebody in the back back there kind of complaining, you know, about, you know, the day. And I heard him say way back there, just out of the clear blue, he said, I'll tell you one thing, said, nobody ever got rich punching a time card, you know. I heard it back there and I punched a time card and went to work. I thought about that later on and said, you know, I think he's right. Nobody ever got rich punching a time card, you know. That ought to be something better than this, you know. So I I went down to the uh, Pawnee Agency again, you know. And in those days, they had the, they had the relocation program, mm -hmm. uh, Indian Indian relocation program, where whereby the bureau would finance you to relocate to to find work in in a big city somewhere or schooling mm -hmm. or whatever it was your desire, you know. And so I inquired about uh, about schooling, about going to school, you know. And uh, uh, I was interested in drafting, drafting and design, you know. And I got the idea working with my dad. I worked with him for a while, you know, on construction, you know. And and one cold, rainy day, we were sitting out there on a construction site, and he had this big blueprint out, you know, laying down there. And uh, reading that blueprint, you know, about the construction that's going on, and I was talking to him. I said, "Hey, Dad," I said. This is a pretty, pretty complex thing here. I said, how, how did you learn to, to read these things? He said, well, son, I've been doing this all my life, you know, and I just kind of came from, from experience. I said, well, could you teach me how to, how to read these things? And he said, son, you don't want to learn to read these things. He said, because if you do, you'll be just like me, out here in the rain and the snow, you know, working in his con construction projects, reading these blueprints. He said, what you need to learn to do is how to make these blueprints. 
He said, the guy that made this thing sits in a nice, warm, air-conditioned office with a white shirt and a necktie and a nice desk, and, and uh, he makes these things. I said, yeah, well, how do you do that? He said, well, that's, that's what they call drafting and design, you know. And so I went to the agency and I said, I want to go to school for drafting and design, you know. And so uh, they, they approved my application, you know, and I went to, uh, went to a, a technical school in San Francisco, you know, a school of drafting and design, you know. And I graduated from there, you know. But while I was there, I was getting involved in other stuff, you know. A lot of activism going on. And I got, I got involved in the activism on Alcatraz mm -hmm. in 1969, you know, and that, that, that Indian activist movement basically kicked off the whole revitalization mm -hmm. of, of Native America, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I was really proud to be part of that, of that operation there, you know. And then I, uh, I enrolled in, uh, in uh, San Francisco State University, you know, in, the, in, a, in a college program. And uh, I uh, acquired uh, a whole number of credits, you know, about a hundred credits, you know, but I didn't graduate, you know. Mm -hmm. And then Oklahoma State University had advertised nationwide about a particular program that they were offering now that was funded by the Department of Labor. And it was called American Indian Manpower Program, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I made an application for that and got accepted to that and transferred from San Francisco State to Oklahoma State University, yeah, no. uh, 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 under a scholarship in that particular program. Mm -hmm. Then I graduated from Oklahoma State University uh, in a regular, regular uh, uh, degree discipline along with the manpower program that was required, you know. And uh, I completed that, graduated from there, went on to graduate program, you know, graduated from there as well. From OSU. From OSU, you know. So I got a master's degree in that, you know. And what I, was the a field, the master's? In education. Education. Adult, yeah. The adult and occupational education, you know. Yeah. And I graduated from the manpower program as well, you know, which was funded mm -hmm. by the Department of Labor, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and a funny thing about that, you know, but that was a, that was a, 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 a federal program that recruited nationwide to attend that to attend that special program, mm -hmm. and that was that was to train individuals who would later become administrators and directors of the of the of the manpower development program, the old MDTA, yeah. and later become CETA and then become JTPA mm -hmm. and so on. And so they were training training uh, uh, Indians from across the nation to to assume administrative roles in those programs, which were yet to yet to come. You know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they recruited from all across the nation. For they had something like a seventy to a hundred uh, people from across the nation enrolled in that program. You know, and uh, so Sandy McNabb, who happened to be the head of the Department of Labor uh, that manpower program in Washington D.C., you know, uh, invited me to come up to his office one day, and he gave me a special award because I was the only person of all of those recruits all across the nation. Who graduated from from uh, both of the programs, from the undergraduate program and the graduate and program? Graduate, that's you know, me. he said a funny <laughs> thing. He said, "You know," he said, uh, "That was a five to ten million dollar grant." He said, "And you're the only person who graduated." He said, "We spent ten million dollars on you, son." <laughs> so that's kind of fun. <laughs> I was just thinking what a great background that is when you go to work for the tribe, when yeah. you come in. Yeah, yeah. I don't know when you got involved yeah. with yeah. that. Well, and then I went on, you know, I went on into a, into a doctoral program. You know? Oh, okay. I did, you know. Okay. And I, I went all the way to uh, dissertation level. Mm -hmm. I finished all my, uh, all of my uh, uh, degree requirements, you know, and I, I was working on my last uh, I don't know, six to nine hours of the of the dissertation requirement, you know. Still at OSU. Still at OSU, okay. you know. And I had done about, oh, two or three of those hours, you know, and then I got involved in the tribe, you know. I got okay. involved working for the tribe, you know, and uh, as administrator of various programs and ended up being a tribal chairman, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never did go back to finish my uh, uh, 
doctoral program. Mm -hmm. So I dropped out of that. So I tell everybody, I said, well, you know, I, I used to tell everybody I was a high school dropout. Now I tell everybody I'm a doctoral dropout. That sounds a lot better. <laughs> what were some of the tribal programs that you were proud of having helped? Oh, the education program primarily, the yeah. higher education program, you know. You know. Back, in, back in my day, you know, uh, higher education programs were very rare. Mm -hmm. They were administered through the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Tribes did not have that prerogative, you know, in those days, you know. All of, all of, the, all of the programs that the, that the tribes now administer, you know, as, as uh, grants from the Bureau of Indian Affairs were all administered by the Bureau at that time. You see, you know, and so if you wanted to get involved in those, you had to go down to the agency, make an application, you know, and and uh, higher education programs were a low priority in those days. Uh, 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 trade and occupational programs were were the emphasis in those days, you know, like that. As part of that relocation program, you know, and they sent a lot of people to trade schools, you know, like myself, you know. So uh, uh, once we once we got to the, got to the tribe and we begin to we begin to contract from the bureau to administer those programs at the tribal level, then we begin to we get, begin to be more effective. And all of a sudden, you know, we begin to get a lot of uh, tribal students into into colleges. You know, mm -hmm. I think I was the first person in my whole tribe ever to graduate. You know, from college. You know, mm -hmm. probably one of the. Of course, I didn't graduate from high school. You know, so. We had very, very few high school graduates even, you know, you know. And today, you know, we have we have a lot of high school graduates, you know, graduating with honors, you know. We have a lot of uh, college graduates, both from community colleges and from the, uh, you know, senior colleges as well, you know. So, mm -hmm. you know, th that program has had a, a great impact over, over the years, you know. Yeah. Right. And that is the one I was primarily uh, responsible for, you mm -hmm. know. Because that's my background. I have my degree in adult and occupational education, you know, so mm -hmm. it just worked out perfectly. Um, so what is the status of speakers of Tonkawa? What is the, how many speakers of Tonkawa do you have and, and do you have a language program yeah. that's going? The, the, the language program is not very, is not very good, I guess I should say, you know. Mm -hmm. That's one of the disappointments that I have in our tribe is, mm -hmm. is I read all over Indian country where language programs are just thriving. Osage, you know, and, and uh, some of the others down there, the Uchi, you know, and, and uh, different tribes, you know. Mm -hmm. They even have symposiums down at OU, you know, and have language language days, you know, down there where kids are running from various schools. And, and, uh, and my tribe is, is just not, you know, when I, when I was there, you know, I, I tried to emphasize the, the tribal culture, you know. Mm -hmm. To me, that's more important than anything, you know, you know, more important than anything, you know. But there's so few, our tribe is very small, mm -hmm. you know, and there's so few of our tribal members who share that sentiment, you know. Most of our tribal members grew up in non, non-traditional environments, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm didn't have that kind of background, didn't have a grandmother or mother who spoke the language in the household, you see what I'm talking about, you know? And so they just, they just didn't have that kind of a background, you know? And, and even to this day, you know, they, our tribal leadership doesn't have that kind of background, you know? And uh, they're more academically inclined, you see, you know? And they don't place a lot of emphasis on, and, and so, I've written a lot of language language uh, studies, you know. I've written a dictionary. I've done all of these oh, things, wow. you know. Uh, it's it's preserved, but how well it's used and applied mm -hmm. is is still kind of uncertain, mm -hmm. you know. More work to do. On yeah, that area. yeah, yeah. So talk a little bit about um, the drum group for Oakland. How you got that started? Well, you know, you know. Powwow, you know, and uh, and dances in, a, in our you know traditional culture is is, is big. Mm -hmm. The state of Oklahoma, it's big, you know, you know. People come to Oklahoma tourists to see Indians and to see Indians in their traditional environments, you know. They don't come to Oklahoma just to go to casinos, you know. 
They want to see Indians dancing and, and ceremonies and things like that, you know. And of course, that's big for us as, mm -hmm. as Indians, you know, native people, you know, warriors, you know, the, the dance, you know, the dances that we perform, the dances of the warriors and the soldier dances and things, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's in, ingrained in our being, you know, to, to, be, to be a part of that and to continue to perpetuate that, you know, for the next generation, you know. And so that's why we have powwows, you know. A powwow basically is a, is a celebration of self, you know. You read every day, Ponca powwow, call powwow, you know, Cheyenne, you know, powwow. And powwows are, are simply a celebration of a nation, of who they are. It's like the 4th of July in America, you know. 4th of July is a, is a celebration of uh, the birthday of America, you know. And that's basically what powwows are. They are a celebration of who we are as a cultural uh, it, uh, entity. You see what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And it's our opportunity then to perpetuate our history through dance, song, and other aspects of our culture. And that's that's important to me, you know, mm -hmm. you know. That's important to me, you know. <clears throat> and there passing was, there on was those... a, There was a Sioux chief way back there by the name of Standing Bear. Not this Standing Bear, mm -hmm. but uh, a Sioux chief by the name of Standing Bear who was who was a participant at the Little Bighorn, you know. And he said something, that, a quote that I use quite often. He said, when you lose the ways of your fathers, you know, you see, when you lose the ways of your fathers, you know, when the sound of the tom-tom is no more, you know, yeah, when the, when the drum and the music is replaced by loud, noisy jazz, you know, from the radio, he said, when you've forgotten all that was your heritage, you know, that had been handed down. I'm not quoting him precisely, but this is the, the essence of what he said. He said, when you lose all of that, he said, you're an Indian no more. Mm -hmm. Even though you breathe and live and walk the streets of big cities, you're dead as an Indian. Mm -hmm. well, I was and thinking so what he's trying to say is, is the, that the, the foundation or the essence of who you are is based on your heritage, your culture, your identity is in, in your language, you know. An Iowa man by the name of uh, Franklin, Franklin Murray wrote one time, his, his, I think his Indian name was the great B, good tract, and he said something to the effect that he said, when you lose your language, basically you've lost your entire heritage, you know. And if you've lost your entire heritage, you're like what Standing Bear said, you're, you're uh, I ended no more. Mm -hmm. Even though you live and breathe and still walk, you know, mm -hmm. you can claim to be an Indian. Mm -hmm. I once uh, attended a, a symposium at Oklahoma State University where they, they invited high school students from all across the state to, to attend an open house, you know, and so uh, high school students from all across the state gathered and, and on a final day of their, of their introduction, they, they assembled in the uh, theater room and, and they had a speaker, a Native American speaker from the Creek tribe by the name of Philip Deer, mm -hmm. known as a kind of an Indian, uh, an Indian uh, 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 spiritual person. Mm -hmm. And he spoke, you know, and I, w I was one of the speakers. So I was sitting there listening to him, you know, and uh, he kind of inspired me, you know, and, and uh, he talked and he talked and he talked, you know. And then, and then he said, uh, in closing, he said, of all the things that I've said to you today, he said, I hope you remember this one thing. He is talking to that audience. I hope you remember this one thing that he said, the greatest failing in life and your greatest failing will try to become something that you are not. You know? And I always remember that, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I was inspired by an evangelist one time. I was watching TV, and this evangelist come out Sunday morning. I was watching him. He walked out into the into the church, and a large congregation gathered. You know, he walked up to the podium and he said, uh, "Before we start this morning service, he said, I'm going to ask a question. How many Christians are here today?" Well, naturally, all the hands went up. You know, because they're in church. You know, how many Christians? All the hands went up. And he said, now, question number two, he said, how do you know that? And one at a time, the hands went down, you know. <laughs> and I thought about that, you know. 
So when I got up to speak to that class that time, I, I used that same, kind of that same example. How many Indian kids here today? And every hand went up. And I said, how do you know that? You know, and a lot of hands went down one at a time. Now some of them stayed up, you know. How do you know that? And you know what some of the answers were? My mom told me. I've got a card. You see, I'm enrolled. You see what I'm talking about? None of that had anything to do with the self-perception of heritage, culture. You see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Well, and I understand. And, and I think, and it was based on what they perceived as blood being enrolled, you know. Right. And I, I've always been of the contention that blood never had anything to do with it. An Indian is a cultural identity, not a blood identity. The government, for some reason or other, labeled us with that notion of having to have a certain having to have a certain degree of blood. There's not another not another group of people on the face of this earth, you know, that is identified by that criteria. Think of this, you know. What if you walked up to a group of students in Oklahoma State University, say that. Uh, uh, a Latin or Spanish group, or the Asian, the Asian group, you know, you know, and say, "Hey, are you full blood?" Huh? Ask any one of them that stupid question, huh? What do you think? What do you think their response would be? Nobody asks anybody what their degree of blood is, except Native Americans. It's a stupid notion. But anyway, that's that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> well, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so I understand one of your favorite parts of the reunion is the powwow. You go to the Shalapa reunions. I was wondering why you enjoy the Shalapa reunions and the Shalapa powwow. Well, that's the, that's part of my heritage. That's that's the part that I enjoy. You know, they have a lot of good things up there. You know, it's week-long celebration, I think. You know, they have a big barbecue, you know, and everybody likes to eat, you know, everybody goes out to eat. And then they have, uh, they have uh, uh, veterans activities, you know, and, and they have uh, uh, health activities, the, the, the walk, you know, the, the walk that they do. And, and a lot of people enjoy a lot of those different activities, you know. I think they even have a dance, you know, a, mm -hmm. uh, White man, dance. White man dance, you know, sock hop, as it were, back in the days, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, old folk sock hop, sock hop, can you imagine that? Yeah. But anyway, you know, and so everybody enjoys that, you know, you see, but I enjoy, I enjoy all of that. I like to go to the barbecue, you know, I like to eat, you know, you can tell that, you know. I have no problem with those things, but uh, but the, the power on the heritage part is, is big to me because mm -hmm. Just the way I've been talking up to now, that is really what defines us as Native Americans, you know. When we lose that, like that standing bear said, we will not be Indians anymore, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, is there anything else we should talk about that we haven't covered? Well, I don't know what your interest is. <laughs> I don't even know why you wanted to interview me, you know, yeah, of all people, you know. Yeah. Well, it, I've heard yeah. some great stories you know, about Shilako's Shilako. had some very notable students come through there, you know. We've had, well, you know, uh, a student, Jim Baker, you know, was student there, came back to be superintendent, you know. We have doctors and lawyers and, you know, and, and people that come out of there, you know. And tribal yeah. leaders. Yeah, tribal leaders, mm -hmm. tribal chairmen, you know. Uh, uh, Medal of Honor winners, mm -hmm. you know. Right. You know, so, so. So school, that school has been great, you know, for people, you know, right. yeah, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good school. I, I, I wish it was still there, to tell you the truth, you know, yeah. yeah. It, okay. it, it was a great school, you know, yeah. Well, thank you for your time today.